Hello and welcome to this Astranti video. Today we'll be looking at the topic of internal hedging techniques. As you'll know if you're studying for BA1 or F3, transaction risk occurs if you agree to buy a product in a foreign currency but the exchange rate changes unfavourably before the product is delivered and you end up having to pay more than you expected. Internal hedging is one way of reducing this risk. This extract is from our video on chapter 12 of F3 and if you want to see the full video this can be found on the Astranti website along with our wide range of products. In this video we'll be considering the example of Carol. She owns a bakery in the UK and has recently agreed to purchase a specialist oven from the United States for $10,000. However since agreeing to buy the oven the value of the pound has fallen from $2 to $1 which has doubled her costs from £5,000 to £10,000. What can she do about this? Well, now I'll hand over to Nick, who has a number of solutions. These are called internal hedging techniques. They are techniques that we can use within the business and the way we're managing the business to keep the risk down. We'll also look at what are called external hedging techniques in a different chapter, which is where you use money markets in order to manage your risk. Okay, But for the moment, just the internal ones. So they are matching, lagging, leading, invoicing in the home currency, counter trading and netting intercompany transactions. Let's have a look at them one by one. Matching then is where receipts in one foreign currency are matched against the payments made in the same currency. So from Carol's point of view, she just happens to have had this order of, of specialist cakes from a US company. That US company, they like to pay in dollars because they've got lots of dollars sitting around. And so what does she do? Well, actually, she's got uh, $12,000 coming in from this contract. She needs $10,000 for her oven and so she aims to match the two up. The um, the oven needs to be paid for in June and so she says to her customer, okay, I need the payment for that big contract in June. I'm gonna make you all these cakes for this big US company, pay me in June the $12,000 and then I use most of that to pay for the oven. So therefore I take my dollars from one company and I put them straight off to the contract. I don't have to do any kind of conversion in that particular case. Okay, so where you're getting the money in in the foreign currency, you just match it against your payments. Now, lagging and leading are similar elements. They're almost like sub-elements of matching. Okay, lagging is where you are pay amounts due later to match against the funds received in that currency. So you might do this if your payment is expected to come in late. So that twelve thousand dollars that Carol's going to be receiving in. Well, she's not actually expecting it till September. So what she does is she makes an agreement with the other manufacturer. Look, I'll pay you in September. Perhaps what she agrees is that she's going to pay um, a little bit more at that point just for the, the interest that, that you know they would have lost for that period of time. You could also do lagging if you believe that the exchange rate is going to move in your favor a little bit later. So it might be that by September, that actually the exchange rate is going to move favorably and this is the way the market seems to be going. So actually, let's wait and pay a little bit later or it's going to cost us a little bit less in exchange. So that can be another reason for doing lagging. Leading is basically where we pay early. So lagging is where we pay late. Leading is where we pay early. Perhaps we're expecting exchange rates to move unfavorably over the next few months. So if now is is February, we're going to pay in June and we're looking at the exchange rates thinking, oh my gosh, it's going to cost us. In Carol's case, this could have been really relevant if there had been an obvious prediction that exchange rates were going to get worse. So let's just pay early. Let's pay immediately. Um, so we're paying in advance. Perhaps we've already, it could also be that Carol's getting that money from that American company in right now. So she's just made that sale. She's getting those $12,000. Okay, let's just pay the $10,000 right now. Pay it in advance so we don't have to do any conversions um, into pounds. So it could be that you just got the money or it could be that you're expecting the exchange rate to get worse. So actually, let's just pay in advance. So yeah, that's probably more relevant for Carol actually than lagging given her the, the scenario that we posed earlier. 
Okay, the next option is to invoice in the home currency. So you simply don't take any risk. Okay, perhaps what Carol could do in her case is agree to pay in pounds. So therefore, the agreement is made. Uh, of course, the question is, is will the other manufacturer accept that risk? Normally, it's the other way around where this is most relevant. So in Carol's case here, it's, you know, she'd have to make a specialist deal with the oven company. Look, I'm going to pay you in pounds. You'll take the hit, effectively. Um, well, they might not want to do that. It's normally the, the seller that has the power. And the seller, in this case, being the, the oven company, will say, look, no, pay me in dollars. I don't want to take the risk. So I'm going to invoice you in dollars, and then um, you know, your Carol, you are going to take the risk in that particular case. But as a company, you know that's one way of avoiding that risk. From Estranti's point of view, we sell throughout the world. Um, we've got over a hundred countries that we've sold our material to, and we always sell in pounds. Um, we don't sell in foreign currencies. This means we don't have any currency risk because everything is in pounds. The risk is on the side of our of our customers for, from that point of view. Um, it would be a, a bit huge hassle for, a have to, for us to have different prices in different countries as well and monitor exchange rates and you know it's just not where we're going to go. So we just sell in pounds and you know, we, we take the hits. If suddenly um, there was a, a big change, it, it suddenly um, recently actually with the Brexit change and the pound is devalued, actually it's meant that overseas customers have been in a beneficial position and buying our products has been has been cheaper for them. Um, I know we've got a lot of customers in South Africa and for a few years prior to that everything was getting more expensive for our South African customers. So you know it uh, th there are issues with invoicing in home currencies particularly over the long term when suddenly products seem to be more expensive to customers and they decide not to use you anymore so yeah there are issues with that but it's definitely a way of avoiding short-term currency risk counter trading is where you barter you say okay well you know you're giving me a product i'll swap it over for something else so the oven manufacturer carol could say okay look you you sell me an oven i'll bake a thousand cakes for you deal done Okay, I'll ship them across. Okay, well, probably the oven manufacturer wouldn't want a thousand cakes. And so it's probably not going to work. So it does require on the supplier and the customer actually needing each other's products to do that. But you can see the benefit here is we just trade products and therefore there's no transaction to be had. There's no currency transaction. So it's a less common one, that one, and probably one you're less likely to see in your exam because you know the, the chances of having suppliers and customers selling to each other in equal amounts is, is probably unlikely. Finally, if we are an, uh, a big company with lots of different departments around the world, what we can do is we can start to look at all of our different departments and divisions all around the world and look at all of their transactions. So for instance, perhaps in Carol's Cake she has a, a Canadian division who are regularly trading with the US as you might expect them to do. And so actually they they she you know she in her UK business hasn't got a, a a ten thousand dollar transaction coming in but actually the canadian business has and so actually they can use the money coming into the canadian firm to pay off the the ten thousand uh, um, dollars so what you can see with netting into company transactions is the centralized treasury department will need to be aware of all the big transactions that are happening between all of the divisions and then be aware of who's trading with who and then start netting transactions off to reduce the risk it's big task okay and a difficult task to do so that will be one reason why it was less popular but on the other hand it would definitely reduce currency risk if it was done so we're now at the end of this Astranti video but there are more to be found on our website as part of our full course on there you can also find mocks and revision notes to help you pass your exams if you want to hear more from us why not subscribe to one of our social media accounts? We can be found on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for watching.